Once again, welcome to a seminar at Försvarspolitiska Arena in Visby. Listening to the Swedish Chief of Defense yesterday, we once again got aware of the problematic security situation in the Baltic region. The theme for today, security challenges in the Baltic region, seems more important than ever. My name is Stefan Ring, and I'm a, I am Secretary General in the Swedish General Defense Association. Uh, we have gathered a group of people with a high competence today for have a discussion about this issue I mentioned earlier. First, I will welcome the Under Secretary of State from Poland, Arthur Novak Farr, for an opening remark. Please take your stand. Uh, so. Yes, it does. <clears throat> Thank you for coming here. Uh, well, I have the lines which are written in a very diplomatic language, <clears throat> but I think what is required is a clarity of message uh, and integrity of judgment. Therefore, I, I don't think I, won't, uh, I, I will beat about the bush. I'd rather say uh, very straightforwardly what I think about the present situation. Uh, and uh, I hope I will give you some insights in uh, how we judge and uh, uh, what we think about the uh, present situation. Well, since the beginning of the crisis in Ukraine, uh, the situation in the Baltic Sea region has deteriorated. Uh, we believe that uh, Russian actions uh, are unnecessarily increasing the tension. We also believe that we should jointly voice our concern vis-a-vis -vis an increased tension uh, which results from the military activity also in the Baltic Sea region. We contend that uh, the increased military activity of uh, uh, Russian uh, counterparts uh, also in the Baltic Sea region has already given and uh, unfortunately will give even further uh, impetus uh, to enhanced cooperation of the regional uh, EU and NATO member states. We also are ready to make full use of the existing cooperation formats like EOP or uh, Visegrad countries, Nordic countries and the Baltic states, for example. Polish-Swedish concept of the Baltic Security Network, which aims to elaborate concrete, pragmatic projects to strengthen cooperation uh, in the region, is a good example of very invigorated co cooperation. Russian actions, uh, actions in Ukraine and in the Baltic uh, region confirm clearly that the military doctrine of the Russian Federation is not a paperwork only. It is crucial, therefore, to understand what's in there. Well, there are some points which I would like to bring your attention to. First of all, the doctrine assumes that the West, NATO, is the enemy. The second, that the neighboring countries have uh, limited sovereignty. Governments which do not follow the Kremlin policy may be recognized as a danger to the Russian Federation. Thirdly, Russia reserves the right to use force and even deployment of nuclear weapons in protection of its interests or citizens abroad. Fourthly, an action of civil society may be considered a threat to Russia and to its historical, spiritual, patriotic traditions of defense of the fatherland. This was uh, a quotation. European Union political and economic sanctions, as well as NATO military power, are of, therefore of crucial importance to us. Both of these instruments should not be perceived as a punishment or a retaliation. They are the, the effective instruments which uh, uh, we can change Russia's policy. They have a significant deterring uh, value. 
our actions today will shape our relations uh, with Moscow tomorrow. They are crucial to the security of the region. We must react consistently, consequently, and clearly to give a strong signal that what is unacceptable will not be accepted. Political maturity, clarity of vision, soundness of judgment, integrity of intention, prudence and responsibility in reaction, and effectiveness in our cooperation, therefore, is badly needed for the nearest future and for maybe uh, somehow more distant future. And that would be the message which I would like to leave with, uh, with yourself. Thank you. Uh, now we shall listen to a uh, analyze by the uh, uh, Deputy Director of International Center for Defense and Security in Tallinn, Martin Hood. Please, the floor is yours. I'd like to thank the organizers of this seminar for inviting me to Visby. Um, the topic of this seminar is security challenges in the Baltic region. And uh, I'm not going to spend very much time on describing these security challenges. I'm, I'm more than sure that you're all aware of them. However, um, I would just say one comment, and I think that what is happening right now in the Baltic Sea region has not come as a surprise for a number of nations uh, bordering to Russia, uh, f certainly not for the Baltic states. So I think that what we see today will uh, remain also in the foreseeable future. The main question that has been asked by the organizers of this seminar has been how shall we meet the challenges to peace and security in our immediate surroundings? And um, I will, in my very short analysis, offer three recommendations that I believe uh, would help us in the, in the near future. Uh, first, political and military decision makers must send clear and strong signals abroad, both to Russia but also to the other member nations of EU and NATO. Second, we must act. Uh, politicians should demonstrate that defense matters. Uh, they must find additional money to spend on defense that will allow the defense forces to train more and to modernize their equipment. And third, especially for non-aligned nations like Sweden and Finland, but also for, the, for other NATO and EU member states, national defense is a prerequisite. Regardless if, for example, Sweden or Finland want to join the alliance eventually or not. Um, for example, when Estonia, when Estonia joined NATO uh, in 2004 together with six other nations, the organization was extremely clear on the need to develop military capabilities that would be useful not only to help other NATO member states, but also to conduct national defense. That is the core uh, task of any uh, armed force. But let me briefly elaborate a little bit more on those three recommendations. I said that the uh, political and military decision makers must send clear and strong signals both to Russia and to other EU and NATO member states. Um, I think that first we need to get firm about the threat perceptions uh, and be clear about who is the opponent and who is the aggressor in this region. It is Russia. I uh, fully realize that the further away from Russia a country is situated, the less of a threat Russia appears. So from that point of view, 
we, uh, it is natural that the threat perception in Lisbon, in Copenhagen, and in Tallinn, they differ, and they differ sometimes significantly. Um, talking about the armed forces, wartime needs and operational capabilities must prevail over peacetime activities that seemed relevant only a couple of years ago. Operational capabilities are today much more important than issues like efficiency, uh, public-private partnership experiments, uh, and, and some of those uh, cliches that uh, were mentioned in NATO and the EU a couple of years ago, more for less being one of those examples. The development of military capabilities is expensive, and uh, when you develop your national defense system, it has to cost money. Um, about signals, I think Nordic and Scandinavian nations are in general well known for taking the initiatives on, on issues that are only vaguely related to the core mission being national defense. And some of those examples are, are called gender perspectives, green defense, etc., etc., which uh, uh, might have been a wise step to take a couple of years ago. Uh, they are, of course, important also in the future, but especially today when it is important to send the right signal both to Russia and to our neighboring states. Uh, and also to act. I think that the rhetoric might even harm countries who spend too much time talking on issues that are not related either directly or indirectly to the core defense, uh, core defense task. But getting the signals right and the messages right is not a problem only for, for smaller and mid-sized states in Europe. Sometimes even the United States get this wrong. And I will just bring one example. Um, at the same time as the US was the first to, to send in uh, company-sized units to Central and Eastern European member states uh, after uh, the occupation of Crimea last year, uh, that was extremely positive. Uh, the U.S. has continued to send also uh, signals of, um, of hesitance. Uh, one example being the fact that now one of these uh, uh, very few units still being here in Europe, the Combat Aviation Brigade in Germany, is going to uh, adopt a continuous rotational deployment in the future instead of having a permanent presence. So this is not easy. Sometimes very uh, experienced nations uh, from a security and defense uh, point of view also get it wrong. Um, the need for concrete and immediate action, that was my second recommendation. That comes of course from the fact that Russia is today acting fast. It is acting also very determined and mainly by training its forces, but also modernizing the forces by buying new equipment. And um, many experts refer to uh, a window of, of opportunity that is seen in Russia as the presidency of President Obama, that of course will end by the end of next year in, in the autumn of 2016. Uh, nobody knows who will be the next president of the U.S., but everybody <coughs> expects the U.S. to provide more leadership. And of course, Russia is afraid for the U.S. being more active in security matters in Europe. Um, which brings us to the speed of action that is needed. We need to act quickly to be able to, uh, to show that we are determined to defend ourselves in Europe. Among many Western nations, the Baltic states and Poland are firm in their willingness to spend more resources on security and defense. Then there is a, another category of nations that uh, has started to express concern about Russians' increasingly aggressive behavior, but has not yet increased defense spending significantly. And I think it's fair to say that these uh, countries uh, are Finland, Sweden, Norway, Denmark, and not to mention other nations in Europe. 
Um, however, if we look at how to actually use the existing forces that uh, we have today, then the NATO member states in the region have in various degree participated in reassuring the newest NATO member states uh, by deploying additional forces to the Central and Eastern Europe. Uh, Sweden, as an example, has decided to increase defense spending, which is very positive, spend more resources on training its forces. However, the budget increase will not be significant, and the action undertaken appears to be relatively slow, bearing in mind the need for speedy action. Uh, sometimes, when looking at these decisions that have been taken to deploy one additional company to Gotland, where we are right now, by 2018, that is three years from now, etc., some of these decisions seem to be long-term and not short-term. My third recommendation was about uh, the need to focus on national defense. And uh, I think uh, it, it deserves to be said that national defense is the core, regardless if, uh, if a nation, be it Sweden, be it Finland, decides to join NATO. After a number of years of defense budget cuts after the end of the Cold War, NATO's European nations uh, have uh, relatively few combat-capable forces left. This is not to be compared with what was here in the late 1980s. A number of NATO member states have already uh, scrapped their capabilities required to do high-intensity warfare and have focused, in my meaning, too much on counterinsurgent activities uh, that were useful in countries like Afghanistan and Iraq but uh, are probably not very useful when facing the new security situation in our region. And in an uh, Article 5 type situation in our region, where one of several of the Baltic states uh, would be under attack, NATO would not have enough forces, uh, and for sure the alliance would not have a, have a surplus of forces to devote to Sweden and Finland. So that the conclusion is that even if uh, Sweden and Finland would expect NATO to come uh, to, to their assistance, if there would be a need, uh, we still are in a situation where there is a single set of forces in NATO and Article 5, the collective defense, is the most important issue and that is only for member states. Uh, Looking also briefly on, on the issue of defense expenditure, the average defense expenditure of NATO's member states in Europe is today 1.5% of GDP, which is uh, well below the recommendation of spending 2% of GDP. And here we have two aspects. One is the fact that the US still spends more than twice as much on defense than the European NATO member states. If we also look at, for example, Sweden, where we are today, then Sweden doesn't spend 1.5%, it spends 1.1%. And in the next three, four, five years, that percentage will still drop a little bit. And that is, of course, again, going back to my first recommendation, getting the signal right. Uh, so, I think I will uh, conclude my, my short analysis by again going back to the three recommendations that I had. We must think through our signals that we send out, the political decision makers, uh, senior military officers. We must act not only three or five years from now, but we must act today. And again, national defense is a core activity. Thank you very much. Thank you, Martin. And now I will ask to the stage uh, Polish ambassador in Stockholm, Wieslav Taika, please, and uh, Jan Sollestrand, State Secretary, Minister of Defense, and uh, Director of FIVAD, Katarina Triash. Martin, don't hide. 
Uh, I, I would ask you who hasn't been able to speak yet, uh, give a short reaction on Martin, or if you have other reflections, it's up to you. Mr. Ambassador, will you please start? Thank you very much. First of all, thank you very much for the hospitality. Uh, I would like to briefly to remind you that we are here in two capacities. We are starting our presidency in the Baltic Sea States, and at the same time we are the contact point embassy for NATO for the coming two years in Sweden. So we are not NATO embassy in, uh, in Sweden, but we are just an inform uh, information point uh, for NATO activities for the uh, Swedish public. So first of all, I would like uh, reconfirm that was our predecessor said that of course that since the situation in Ukraine the events in Ukraine the situation in the Baltic Sea region deteriorated uh, and we think that the actions of Russia are unnecessarily increasing tensions in the region and especially the uh, we are very much concerned with the Russian announcement concerning the possibility of deployment of nuclear missiles in the region so transferring Iskander missiles to Kaliningrad Oblast during the last military exercises shows uh, the nuclearization of Kaliningrad as a real uh, and present danger but on the other hand, we think that um, increased Russian activity in the Baltic Sea region should give new impetus to enhance cooperation of uh, the regional EU and NATO member states. And of course, this format V4, N5 plus B3, for example, is a possible uh, solution. Uh, and of course, this Polish-Swedish concept of the Baltic security network, where, which aims to elaborate concrete, as we think, and pragmatic projects to strengthen cooperation in Baltic Sea uh, regions. So we think that, of course, it is a challenge that we, we should face, and of course, we should uh, stay active. Thank you. Jan Solis now. Thank you very much. Um, well, my reflection is that uh, we agree upon most things. I think we share the concerns uh, very clear. Uh, I think further on that it is very important that we have a clear voice uh, through uh, the uh, EU, through the world as a whole and to, towards Russia. Um, it's important that we continue to, to build security together in, in all matters. And um, we have, even if, if I understood from, from Martin's speech that you find it too little, I think we have a clear uh, message from Sweden and by increasing our defense budget in the next five years with more than 10 percentage and from our from a Swedish perspective that is a very very clear stand and we are also have a vast majority of the parliament behind that uh, so we share the concerns and we uh, think we are taking steps to to be part of to to uh, take steps uh, or, or to do something about it Katarina, please. Yes, I'm also going to give a Swedish perspective that probably differs from, uh, from uh, Mr. Salas Dans. Uh, thank you so much for inviting me. And I want to thank uh, uh, Mr. Undersecretary and Martin Hurt for the very clear message that, messages that both of you send. It usually takes a pole or a bolt to have this kind of clarity that we rarely <laughs> hear here in Sweden. So thank you for that. I completely agree with your points, Martin. Uh, I think that, as you said, there are three things that are most important. It's about sending messages, acting, and building a strong defense. Uh, the last few years, or the last year, there has been a lot of talk in Europe amongst politicians and security experts, more notably amongst politicians, about Europe's new security order being shattered and about 2014 being a game changer our own defense minister have used that very same phrase. Uh, unfortunately, the political solutions that we have seen in response to that does not reflect that 2014 has been a game changer. Uh, we have not increased our defense spending significantly. As you very well pointed out, it will in fact decrease the, last, uh, the next few years. And also, even though that the security situation is so serious right now. Everyone agrees about that. The current government still decides to rule out even investigating NATO membership. Uh, so I don't think that that signalizes a serious game changer. And well, that's a different Swedish perspective. 
Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, of course. I, I, I think that uh, Jan Sollestrand wants to respond a little bit to this um, analyze which has been given by Katarina, for example. Well, uh, you can always say that uh, uh, everything is uh, too little uh, and uh, that we could do more. But let me remind you that we, this is, of course, a democracy. We have had a defense uh, uh, committee that uh, laid their report in 2014 in May, and the majority there came out with, uh, or the former government, and the majority came out with a, a plan to increase the budget fundings for the defense with the seven billions in the next five-year period. What we did now this spring was together with, uh, with uh, the opposition and we came out with five parties that agreed upon to add additionally 10 billions, which make 17 uh, uh, as a whole during the coming years. You can always say that it's too little, of course, but uh, I think also it will take some effort to actually do something good of this money because it's not uh, only having money, you ha also have to, to uh, get the money into personnel, into material, and so on. So I'm not saying that this is the final uh, effort from Sweden, and we will probably have to do more, but this is a clear step from where we were. And uh, I think uh, uh, we ha will have a challenge to, to, to fulfill the efforts in the ni next per period. Uh, Katarina, you have just published a book, uh, Freden Sav. Uh, I think it will come in English also. The, the sea of peace, or what we call it. Um, in that, you, you talk about security complex, that this region is a security complex. C can you please uh, ev elaborate on, on, on this issue a little bit? Uh, yes, definitely. I think uh, a part of the perception in Sweden is that Swedes have experienced peace for over 200 years. And I think that that has left a mark in the Swedish mentality. Somehow we still feel excluded from the surrounding world. And we feel that a conflict is something that is very far away and almost that it's impossible for us to be affected. Uh, and what I mean when I mention the security complex, I refer to studies of the Swedish uh, Defense Research Agency, FOE, uh, that states that Sweden cannot be non-involved in the event of a security crisis in the region, that in fact all of the countries are intertwined. So I think that a very important message to send to the Swedes is that in the event of a conflict in the Baltic region, all of the countries, including Sweden, will be involved. Thank you very much. Mr. Ambassador. Thank you, Thank you very much. Uh, and of course, we as uh, Poland, as a member of NATO, we of course, we have full respect for the internal debate and for the history of Sweden, for the internal uh, debate in Sweden. But of course, we have uh, some tools in place already, and this is the NATO partnership policy. Uh, and uh, we, of course, as Poland, we advocate um, development of this uh, NATO partnerships policy uh, that improves both the security of uh, the allies, but as well of our partners. And of course, our attention focuses now on uh, countries like Sweden, Finland, but uh, Ukraine, Georgia, and Moldova as well. We are in practical terms as well um, interested uh, in the su support of the idea of uh, the reinforcement of Eastern flank. And it is especially of uh, the presence of Swedish officer in Szczecin in this multi multinational corps. Uh, and of course, uh, encourage the sending of officers to NFIU in, uh, in Bydgoszcz, in Poland. Uh, and we, of course, we, are, we welcome the decision of Stockholm allowing Swedish Navy to participate in the standing uh, NATO mine countermeasures uh, group um, uh, one. Uh, for, uh, for the fur uh, further, we would like, of course, to strengthen uh, cooperation both with Sweden and Finland. Uh, and it means uh, these uh, Swedish ideas of interoperability, exercises, uh, uh, NRF, and enhanced politic di uh, political dialogue with partners. Uh, and uh, we are ready to host in Warsaw next meeting of EOP uh, format, uh, and we are still working on, on, on modalities. Um, uh, and uh, that we think that this format would give added value for, for uh, as, again for both the partners and for, for, for the allies. 
Uh, and of course, uh, we should together uh, uh, try to help the other neighbors of, of NATO countries like Georgia, Moldova, and Ukraine. Thank you. Do you want to? Uh, <clears throat> well, I just, uh, first I want to, to just comment upon uh, what you said, Katrina, about uh, 200 years of peace in Sweden. Uh, we are, I think, everybody most aware about that that affects us, <laughs> the Swedish mentality as a whole, that we probably uh, sometimes not realize uh, what's uh, ongoing and how it can affect us. And I totally agree upon if there will be a, a military conflict in real sense in, in the region, it will affect us all. It, it will, I, I can't see, and I said it before on this stage, I can't foresee that anyone can keep out. Um, also, I just, I will not repeat, but I think it's important, and therefore, uh, even if we are not having NATO membership on the agenda, we are acting within all the forums that we can, in the European Union, together with the Nordic countries, with, together in the partnership, uh, and we have the enhanced opportunity programs, which, which we value highly. Uh, we are valuing the transatlantic link and so on. So what we're doing is that we're playing with all the players to try to be part of it and try to build security. And that is important, so you're just not focusing on what we not are doing, uh, instead focusing on what we, we are doing. Katina. We're not doing enough. Uh, <laughs> is this on? Oh, no? Oh. You can hear me? Yeah. No, thank you. Oh, okay. Uh, uh, no, but I think, uh, of course, uh, a lot of measures have been taken, and uh, Sweden is active in a number of for us. Uh, therefore, it's extra interesting that the most important, the most significant fora is being, uh, of course, there's cooperation, but that membership still keeps being excluded when the situation is as serious as it is. So, so to me, that doesn't make sense. Uh, uh, on the part of Sweden being affected by 200 years of peace, uh, I would just like to, to use a quote that was um, phrased... Um, phrased in the movie Casablanca, and that was lifted in the excellent report that came out by Edward Lucas last week. And I think it describes the Swedes very well. It's when the character Rick in Casablanca says that the problems of the world are not in my department. And I think that that phrase very well still sort of puts the finger on the Swedish mentality that is still dominant. Uh, can I have the picture, please? Uh, Martin talked about uh, lack of resources in uh, NATO. And uh, here we have a uh, opinion survey made by Pew. Uh, and it uh, says that if a serious military conflict with one of its neighboring countries, that is our NATO ally, do you think our country should or should not use military force to defend that country? use Article 5. And here you have the numbers of, in, the, uh, in the survey. What, what, what is your analyze of, of this survey? Mr. Ambassador. Uh, I would say that, uh, first of all, I, I don't know, is it working? Uh, I would say, I know, of course, this, and the proportion should not and should is, uh, is crucial here, the proportion of the, the, the two yeah. sides. I would not fix on, only on one side. You should look uh, on both yes, sides. Yes, but I would like to say that all our countries are uh, democracies. And of course, all we have the same uh, internal uh, debate. Of course, we in Poland, we have our historical memory. And of course, it is easier for our politicians to uh, explain what, why it is important to, to be able to defend. That is the historical experience uh, that can be traced in each and every family in Poland. But I think that we should not forget one logic, that Poland, and I think that presume Baltic countries and all uh, Scandinavia, we are at the most interested in a peaceful and prosperous Russia. So it, is, it should not be understood as anti-Russian. But we understand that we should judge what people are doing, not by that what they are saying, but what they are doing. And what we see now, Russia has done things that have really ruined the post-war order in our part of uh, Europe. And it is dangerous for us all. So I think it is a crucial thing. And the second thing, when I very often hear discussion about healthcare, education versus uh, defense budget, 
But I remember a, say, a wise saying, I think it was a German uh, um, uh, philosopher that said it, that security is not everything, but the rest, all the rest, without security is nothing. And I think that we should not forget this, that of course, say security in itself is nothing. But if we do not have security, everything else does not matter. So I think uh, we have, uh, we in Poland, we have this understanding because we we have we can refer to the past and to our historic uh, experience. So repeating, we are interested in peace. We are interested in uh, peaceful co cohabitation, but we should really react accordingly to that what we see and what is done, and not what it is said. And sometimes I have an impression that a discussion is in the uh, in the world of words and not of uh, of reality that we are really, uh, uh, by which we are challenged. I, I will not ask you to comment on other NATO countries, but Martin, how do you analyze this? Uh... Uh, well, I have uh, looking at these figures, and I've been uh, been asked for my opinion <laughs> earlier as well. And I think that that there, there are a number. Of, uh, answers that come out of this poll as well. Uh, the first is that uh, disregarding the fact if, if uh, an, a specific nation is a member of NATO or not, uh, you need to deserve to be supported in, in a crisis situation. If uh, you have not very much invested into security and defense, if you have not spent very much time and resources to, uh, to foster cooperation with your most important and c your closest allies, then you are probably not very likely to uh, to uh, receive support, even if you are a NATO member state. And when you are attacked, uh, that is one thing. Uh, a, th a second thing is that I think this poll corresponds to similar polls that we have been done in Estonia over the last uh, five, ten years, uh, but not asking the same question, but asking the question about what Estonians in general expect in support. And I think that the figure in Estonia is also around 50% in terms of, of uh, half the population actually expects support from other NATO members, and half don't really believe in it. So also in Estonia, there is a strong sense of the need to act on our own and to spend money on defense because support might or might not come from other, other NATO allies. Third, I would just comment and say that uh, in a crisis situation, there will, of course, be no uh, referendum in, in NATO or in the member states like we see now coming up in Greece. Uh, there will be a quick political decision. It will be taken in the North Atlantic Council. Uh, the decision might come quickly, but then again, what I pointed out in my analysis was that the defense capabilities also in NATO member states are not the ones that existed 20, 25 years ago. Um, and the fourth uh, thing is, of course, the need for politicians to address their own populations. It goes for Sweden, it goes for Germany, it goes for Italy. Uh, there is a need, again, today in 2015, to talk about the need to defend uh, our own nations, uh, the need to f defend our allies. Uh, I think that was something that was done very often in the 1980s. And, of course, by the end of the Cold War, that uh, need somehow disappeared. And uh, it was succeeded by a discussion about the need to support other uh, people in need, uh, be it Afghanistan or, or be it uh, nations in Africa. Time has come again to talk about the need to defend our own nations and, uh, and our allies. I think it is another aspect uh, that uh, we forget sometimes that NATO uh, is um, a consensus-based organization. So the decision-making process uh, and even the reaction it may, be, may last some time. So the ability of a country to defend themselves and to wait for the, for the support is, uh, may, may be crucial. So I think there are two elements uh, to, to two sides of, of, of the same uh, coin. Katharina. 
Yes, uh, I was hoping that you wouldn't show that picture, actually, because it doesn't support my, my strong pro-NATO case. Uh, no, but of course, I was extremely depressed when I saw this picture, uh, most notably by, by Germany. Uh, and uh, the 53% was it that was against uh, defending an ally? Uh, this shows that NATO, of course, also has problems. And there is a problem with unity within NATO. And as the ambassador pointed out, NATO is a consensus organization. And this makes it even more important that small countries, such as Sweden, and the ones that are members of an alliance or the ones that aren't, uh, still maintain a strong national defense. It's also a good selling point. In order to make others to come to your defense, you have to sort of look after your own house. Uh, so I think this, the positive outcome of this study could be that it increases the incentives for national defense spending. Are we witnessing a dangerous escalation? And is military means and deterrence the most important way to stop the escalation? Or um, are there other means that we should use. Mr. Ambassador. So I, I, I would repeat, I, I think, uh, I'm afraid that, uh, that the, uh, the problem that we have in the East is there to stay, because we see that there is uh, a tendency to petrify uh, the conflict in, in Ukraine. And, and the doctrine, and the Russian doctrine is as, as it is. And we have seen that the doctrine is not only on paper, but it is put in, put in action as well. So what happened in Donbass or what happened in Crimea, it is nothing else than a realization of the doctrine that we have uh, read, uh, read before. So I think we should react uh, accordingly. And uh, illusions would be the worst uh, reaction to that what is happening. Mr. Sonnenstern. Uh, <clears throat> well, I agree uh, upon that. I think, first of all, the main step is to act very firm and uh, to build security and to have uh, actually the, the possibility to take action as, your, uh, as the country and together with others. Um, because you have to have a guarantee uh, uh, so you can be prepared whatever happens. Uh, and also, I would say that Russia as a whole, as a country and their mentality, at least from my, my, my uh, meetings with the Russians through the years, is they don't respect weakness, they respect uh, strengthness. And, and then you can maybe, I say maybe, get in some kind of, of dialogue, dialogue with them. But at the same time, we, we have to think parallel. We also have to think, how do we get from here out of this? Um, and at, right now I'm quite pessimistic, but you have to think about it and not only about I increasing your power, which is, once again, the fundament, the basic, but you have also to think, how can we come out of this uh, in, in, a, in some uh, matter in the future? Karina. I'm glad to be in a pal panel that agrees on this and, uh, and of the importance of showing force and showing resoluteness be behind force. Uh, there's a tendency in the Swedish debate to describe uh, increased defense spending, such as escalating the situation, that we're as bad as Putin if we sort of uh, go into this defense spending, defense um, practicing game. Uh, that's a very dangerous tendency. Uh, as Mr. Salasan pointed out, uh, Russia respects resoluteness. Russia respects force. It doesn't mean that we will use the force, but we have to show that we are prepared to defend our core values. Martin, short. Short, uh, five points. First, um, I think we need to, <laughs> I need to, uh, uh, I think we should use all the tools in the toolbox. And it is of course obvious that over the last 20 years, some of those tools, especially the military tools, have been neglected. First, diplomacy is of course important, obviously. But we can't solve the problem in Ukraine by using solely diplomacy. Second, uh, sanctions uh, are imposed on Russia and need to be used also in the future. But obviously, that is a long-term weapon. It won't solve the problem in the short term. Uh, third, uh, selling and exporting weapons to Ukraine. Obviously, that is not going to solve the, uh, the conflict in Ukraine on its own. But again, as one of, to of the tools in the toolbox, I think that should be not only considered, but decided upon. Uh, fourth, uh, still bilateral cooperation with Russia is important because especially the neighboring nations 
uh, who are, are neighbors of Russia need to cooperate with the neighbor regardless of the, the bigger problems that we have. And I think that uh, Estonia is, is uh, as successful as we can be in this. We are getting closer and closer to signing a border agreement with Russia. Uh, even though uh, we have seen these very negative trends in the, the uh, 2014 and 15, and finally, soft power uh, is is a use, uh, is a tool to be used to counter Russian propaganda. So, uh, I think we, to, we need to use all different tools in the toolbox. Thank you very much, and I think this will be the ending of this seminar. I have a lot of more questions, but the time is out, and I will thank you very much for. You being here and discussing this very important thing. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ambassador.